I don't have any introduction to Walter other than to say, in my view, in my view, I think of him as a national treasure. And I mean that sincerely. I don't give compliments. As many of you know, I don't give compliments easily. So let's just turn it over to, uh, to Walter Ziffer, and, uh, and we'll see how it goes. There'll be some talking and then some time for questions. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how much time do I so have? So the whole uh, class is over at 430. So, it's so a, can I go tell about, uh, say, 4.15, uh, sure. a little bit less. You can do whatever you want. We'll play it by ear. We'll play it by ear. I, I enjoy the question part I know best, you do. You I know, know you do. I know you do. Because that's when the people really you know, yeah. react. OK. Thank you. Thank you. OK, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Well, no, you didn't invite me. Steve invited me. But I can thank you anyway. Uh, my name is Walter Ziffer. And uh, I live in Weaverville, if you know where that is. And uh, I married, second time. And I have 10 grandchildren. And I have four great-grandchildren. I'm 91 years old. So if I start, you know, shaking up, you know, sort of not being very steady on, on, on my feet, I expect the women in particular <laughs> to come up here and to support I'll me. Make sure okay. That, Walter, yeah. I no, I'm I'm prejudiced. I just like women better than men. Uh, you can ask me questions afterwards. <laughs> I'll try to respond to them. Um, and uh, I'm originally from Czechoslovakia, which no longer exists. It's now the Czech Republic and Slovakia. <clears throat> But it was a peaceful sort of goodbye between the two. I have uh, taught in France for 10 years, in Belgium for five years, in Washington, D.C. for a number of years. And uh, then I retired and uh, went to Canada and fell in love with Canada. I don't know, Canadians are really lovely people, you know. You're, you're to try that. Go, go see Canada. And there's no, um, no wall between us and Canada. <laughs> there will be one. Uh, there will be? Well, the, the, the lower wall that's coming up, I'm ready to jump over it, <laughs> you know, to go south. But the other one isn't up there, so OK. And uh, see, what else can I tell you? Um, I think it's good enough. Uh, oh, yeah, I've had a number of degrees, of course, after my name, which no point going into, I don't think. Uh, and uh, that's all. And I'm, I'm very pleased that um, your professor invited me. And uh, I'm open to any question you have, uh, really anything, anything, anything. Uh, so that's then my introduction. Uh, I'm a Holocaust survivor. I was in camps for three days, but uh, three days, three years, and uh, three years before under Nazi occupation. And of course, that's what I'll tell you about. But before I do that, I want to tell you another reason why I accepted this, to be invited, because I don't always accept invitations, at my age in particular. And one of the reasons for accepting is that I'm worried about the time that, I'm, that we're living in right now. Uh, and um, I, I have no bone, personal bones to pick with our president, obviously. I don't know the guy. I don't particularly want to get to know him. But um, I'm worried because having lived in Europe uh, during World War II uh, as a Jew and uh, having been in the Holocaust for three years and just having survived by the skin of my teeth, you might say, when a lot of other people died, were, were murdered, basically. And we'll talk about that, of course. Uh, I am worried, and I'm here actually sort of to uh, warn you. Uh, 
uh, I, I think that's the, the right word to say. Uh, if what happened happened, which it did, okay, it is because people were apathetic, and I'm talking about the German population. They did not seemingly use any critical thinking, which is absolutely uh, important wherever you are and whenever you are. Um, um, it's particularly important right now because the main problem being that we are told a lot of lies. And critical thinking helps you to distinguish between lies and truth, okay? Uh, and I vote for truth uh, rather than lies. And uh, th th bad things have, have been happening here. I mean, let's face it, um, I was, I'm still in shock uh, as a father and as a grandfather and as a great-grandfather that our people, our American friends uh, that I thought have pretty much a high standard of ethics lend themselves to separate little children and babies from their parents at the southern border, okay? That, I mean, that stinks to high heaven as far as I'm concerned. And uh, again, I went through something similar, and you'll hear it in a few moments. And so I'm speaking from experience, not as a parent, but as a child, that because I too was separated from my, from my parents at one point. Uh, and I feel very strongly that I suffered less than my mom and my dad at that particular point, okay? Um, and you can, as I said before, ask questions afterwards, and I'll try to enlarge on all that. Uh, right now, there are 800,000 people out of jobs because somebody's crazy dream. And uh, I sort of think it's uh, a, something uh, of a narcissistic dream, uh, a person that has fallen in love with himself. That's what happened to Narcissus you know, in, in Greek um, mythology. And so uh, forever and ever now, we're going to be able to look at a gorgeous wall and say that is the Trump wall. What brings to my mind, of course, is a Chinese wall, okay? That, that is a piece of art and whatever. Um, so that, that has me very much upset. Um, I am upset by our president's attacks on, uh, on the press, uh, a press that is obliged, and I think to a great extent, is doing its job of reporting Truthful, truthfully, the events that are happening. Uh, why am I all upset about this? Because this very similar things happened in Germany in preparation for Hitler's ascendancy to power, okay? So what I'm saying, warning, okay, used the word before. You know, keep your eyes and your ears open um, and, and react, be politically involved, okay? I'm, I'm saying this because I'm concerned, not out of any kind of a feeling of hatred. Why should there be that? But uh, I'm, I'm really concerned and, and afraid. Uh, I don't know, do, do you people know what the word democracy means? You know where it comes from? Well, democracy derives from the Greek demos, which means people, okay? and. Um, Krasi, democracy, comes from kritein, which means to rule. So it is, as we've heard in our, as we hear, have heard in our own American tradition, democracy here is a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Now, I ask you, um, is it possible that we, the people, are responsible for 800,000 people in our country now uh, having to work or, or not working anymore, but certainly not being paid. Do you think that's the work of the people? If you do, there's something wrong with you, okay? That's the, that's the, that, that, that is being caused for one person, by one person, and it's not right. So um, 
I think I'll stop here. You can see where I stand. I'm truthfully worried because I've gone through a similar time and uh, it was a hell of a time. And when I say hell, I mean hell, man-made hell, not the kind of hell that we read about the, in the Bible, you know, uh, which is imaginary stuff, but hell as people make a hell for other people. Okay. So, where do I begin? I've heard other Holocaust survivors speak, which you, you could, could have uh, thought of yourself, I, that I'd go out and listen to somebody else with a similar experience to me. And I, many of these people began their talk by saying, you know, one day I woke up and suddenly the life that I had been living, which was a good life basically, was gone. Everything had changed in my life. And what they are referring to, of course, is uh, some action based or caused by anti-Semitism. Does everybody know what anti-Semitism means? Yes, okay. It's the wrong way to begin because anti-Semitism did not begin from one day to the other with Hitler's ascendancy to the chancellorship of Germany. That is not correct. I mean, his ascendancy to, to the chancellorship was legal, actually. Uh, you know, there was no revolution taking place or anything like that. And so uh, what I want to tell you is that anti-Semitism is 19, well, 20 centuries old. It's been going on. And it's an absolutely disgusting kind of movement that makes no sense. An example, okay? I was eight years old. I'm 91 now, okay? You can do the arithmetic yourself. Uh, I was eight, eight, probably maybe nine years old when I was in a school, in elementary school in my hometown of Chesky Cieszyn. I will not ask you to repeat this because you couldn't do it. Uh, and um, I had a friend who was uh, what we call in Judaism a Hasidic Jew. It means uh, from a family that, very, um, that was very um, uh, Jewishly oriented and uh, obedient to all the laws that you find in the Bible, etc., etc., etc. So my father was not a particularly religious person. He was the president of the last congregation, of the last Jewish congregation in our town, but not, not very religious. Do you know what kosher food is? Okay, we didn't keep a kosher house, uh, and we still don't. I still don't, my wife still doesn't. Um, so Jacob Katz, my friend, and I walk home, and our town, which had about 25,000 people or so, <coughs> has, is sort of divided in two halves with railroad tracks running through the middle of town. So divided. How would you get across the railroad tracks? Well, there's like uh, steps down, a little tunnel underneath, steps up, okay? I uh, wrote a memoir which was published uh, coming March two years ago on my 90th birthday. And th there's a picture in here, which we are free to look at, which shows the entrance to, to that little tunnel. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the, door, the, the, uh, the book open here so you can have a look at it. Yeah, okay, it's down here. You wanna pass that around if you want to. So. Uh, we go down, Jacob and I, and suddenly we hear a lot of screaming and shouting and rocks being thrown at us. And what, what was the content of the screaming, of the screaming sounds? It was Jid, Jidek Spinavi Jinek. Now, anybody here speaking Czech? <laughs> Nobody. Okay, Jid in all Slavic languages means Jew. And Spinavi Zidek means filthy little Jew, okay? So we start running. He runs in one direction, I run in the other direction to save ourselves from being hit. Good-sized pieces thrown at us. And so I saved myself behind the glass doors of, of, a, um, uh, of an apartment building. They did not pursue me. 
but they pursued Jacob. And I could see where that was happening. <clears throat> and just as they were about to catch up with him, uh, our town idiot starts coming out. And I, I don't have, what's a town idiot? I don't know, town idiots in Bangor, I don't think. There are a lot of idiots here. But, uh, you know, as in other towns. But um, uh, town idiot was a man who was um, uh, some, somewhat sick, uh, not, not quite right in his head, and um, a wrinkled person who has very long hair. And he picked up the droppings of the horses. There were practically no cars in our town. And uh, he came with a big uh, sign marching through the town to announce the coming of the circus, you know, and stuff like that. And the kids were running behind him. He was challenged, obviously, mentally and maybe even physically. And uh, we were making fun of him. And every so often when they came near, by, near him, he would turn around and roar like a lion. Wow, you know, like that. And the kids were scared and fell back immediately. So this guy comes. Uh, he had a two-wheel chariot, picked up Jacob, put him on the chariot, galloped away with him, and deposited him in front of his parents' house. His father was a tailor. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because I want to particularly convey to you what w would have happened to Jacob if the boys had caught up with him. Uh, these boys who, who shouted, Jew, filthy Jew. They would have pulled up his pants, and they would have beaten him up. And Jews are circumcised. Whether you know that or not, I don't know. Practically all the boys in America a few years ago were automatically circumcised in, uh, in the hospital. But uh, this was not the case then. And so they would have probably sort of did a sort of a dance around him, maybe spat at him, beaten him up, and then let him go. Okay, that happened more than once, and I actually have seen this sort of thing. So what I'm getting to is that anti-Semitism occurred and lived even then already. Uh, and my father, being the head of the last, the president of the congregation, would come home every so often and share with my mom incidents, anti-Semitic incidents. Uh, so the person who started her talk by saying things changed from one, from, from one evening to the next morning was not quite correct. Anti-Semitism has been around for 20, 20 centuries. Now, when you go back 20 centuries, you've probably studied history to some extent, all of you. What time was that? Pardon? 20 centuries ago. Well, you have to talk louder because that's right. Post, post Jesus. Jesus was a Jew. He was an anti-Semitic, obviously. But um, yes, the beginning of the church, you might say, and the competition between Judaism and Christianity, which begins there. And uh, I wish I had more time to deal with that subject, because that is the beginning of anti-Semitism, really, which is basically the first century, early second century. OK. so. I was in Czech school. We spoke German at home. My native language, well, they dual Czech and, po uh, Czech and German. And our town was on the border with Poland. In 1938, the Poles marched into our town and just took us over, annexed our town. Uh, that was the beginning of World War II, uh, 1st of September, 1939, OK? So we were occupied as Poles even though we were Czechs, okay? The year under Poland was absolutely miserable. Most of the anti-Semitism and the most crude and rude anti-Semitism happened in Poland. And this is why Hitler placed most of the terrible concentration and death camps into Poland. He knew there would be no resistance on the part of the... There was an underground in Poland also, to be, to be honest that fought the Germans, but uh, the vast population was anti-Semitic. Anti 
So I remember a case, for instance, where during that one year I was called to, uh, to stand on a podium next to, next to the, uh, the, the, the professor. That was fifth grade, by the way. And we had to declaim a poem in Polish. Well, I was publicly uh, just taken down by the professor. He made fun of me in front of the whole class because A, my Polish wasn't correct, my language was Czech. Now the two languages are related, the Slavic languages, but still it's a different language. And I was a Jew. And so he started talking to me in, in a pretend Yiddish voice. You know what Yiddish is? Yiddish is a special Jewish language that developed in Eastern Europe. And uh, there's Polish in it, and there's German in it, primarily German, really, uh, and some Hebrew. So it was a miserable year. Come September 1st, 1939, and um, my sister, the, the town is uh, totally abandoned, by the way, at that point. And my sister and I uh, are at the window looking out. Um, and suddenly we hear a lot of noise and sort of chaotic noises that come to us. And we see the retreat of the Polish army, a chaotic retreat. I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you there were cows, goats, sheep, there were soldiers, uh, there was cavalry, there were, there were cannons that they pulled, there were personnel carriers, there were motorcycles, and there was shouting and cussing, cursing, and um, just a chaotic retreat. All across our bridge and to the other side of our town, uh, the, the former Polish town, and then east toward Russia. So we see this, we really don't make sense of all this with a bunch of kids. And then uh, after a moment of quietness, there comes the German army. In perfect order, they march in with their vehicles and everything else. And they go follow the same path, you might say, uh, across the bridge east. And um, uh, I must say I was impressed as a child to see these perfectly dressed uh, really beautiful people marching through the town and just through. And we were occupied. And then another hour or two later came the occupation troops were SS troops in their black uniforms. And they settled in, okay? And our particular misery was that they settled one story below us in a beautiful home where our apartment happened to be. Now that in itself was pure hell, because every time we walked out of the house, came back, we had to go through the mezzanine, the first floor, which was full of SS people who tripped us up, who laughed at us, you know, just ugly stuff. And, uh, but nobody actually assaulted us, I have to say that. We didn't stay there very long because we were kicked out about uh, 10 days later or so. And uh, lost everything my, my parents had accumulated during the marriage, basically. Your parents probably have stuff that people have given to them, you know, gifts and stuff like that. And of course, maybe uh, silver, uh, knives, forks, etc. All, all kind of stuff, okay? So we left each with about each person, it's about two suitcases, okay? And we moved to my uncle's house, who owned an apartment house. And the apartment house, interestingly enough, was in a street that led to the plaza that is on the front of that book that, I, that, that you have there somewhere. Do you, you see that? The people standing there like this, and that was Heil Hitler, right? And uh, it was Joseph Goebbels, the minister of propaganda that had come to town and given a speech. And that I did not photograph this. This comes out of a tourist book that uh, I've, I found this picture in. Okay, uh, our town is a very old town. It goes, goes back to the 13th, 14th century. So there's a castle there and uh, a lot of tourism. So I found this tourism book when I was there the last time. Actually, it was given to me and I found this picture and that ended up in, in the front of the book. Okay, so. We were evicted four times. 
from various places, squeezed together every time more and more and more, until we ended up in a ghetto uh, on the periphery of our town, uh, just short of 1,000 Jewish people, okay? Uh, this was an abandoned uh, entertainment place. Uh, the, there were a couple of restaurants there, uh, and there were dance halls there, but all abandoned in very bad shape. And so 1,000 people in, in these dance halls and in these outbuildings, it was, had been a farm at one time, I guess. And the people, in order to have some privacy, uh, strung wires from one end of the dance hall to the other in this direction, sort of latitudinally and longi longitudinally this way, and creating squares, you might say. Or, or, and on these wires, they would hang some bed sheets or wh whatever, some textile material to have privacy. My family uh, was uh, in the middle of the stage of one of those dance halls with two families on each side. We're living in a ghetto is no picnic, obviously. Uh, so I want to tell you one story, one of the first really, uh, call it most traumatic moment in my life. Uh, we young people improvised some ping pong tables, play ping pong there. Uh, it was crude stuff, obviously. And we played, and as we played, I got to know a young woman whose name was Lydia and I fell in love with her. And it was reciprocal. She liked me very much too. And I won every ping pong match we had. But um, after she had lost, she had this beautiful, tinkling silver bell voice. So I was totally undone, you know. So in the midst of the misery, that's what I'm trying to convey to you, that we all lived, there were these wonderful moments when we had love. So uh, my father made it possible for, young, for some young people, about 40, 45 of us, to work in a war-related industry. But we had to take a train over there. Uh, took about 45 minutes or so. And to work in the night shift making bolts and nuts. It's a big, big outfit. And so Lydia and I, of course, traveled together. And in the train, you know, we held hands and um, cheek to cheek. My cheeks were burning up. Um, it was a lovely time. And then one evening, we were there about three months, four months maybe, uh, doing this work. And then one evening in the ghetto, Lydia came to the stage where we stayed, where we lived, and said, Walter, I have bad news. Well, who wants to listen to bad news? What was the bad news? Her parents decided to leave, the, to escape the, um, uh, the ghetto clandestinely and to somehow march one way or another, get, go east toward Soviet Russia, which at that time was a haven for Jewish people uh, who were fleeing Nazi Germany. <clears throat> so we had, we had to say goodbye to each other and um, she uh, had a gold chain and a pendant on it. And she took the pendant off the chain, gave it to me, and said, Walter, you keep this pendant, and whenever you take a look at it, you'll remember me. And I'll be back in a few weeks, and we'll date again, you know. Well, I have a copy of a pendant in my pocket here. Uh, by the way, I had exactly the same pen pendant made for my wife a, a week, about a year ago. She was absolutely thrilled. But this is a cheap one that a teacher gave me. I speak in schools, you know, and uh, a teacher heard me tell this story. And then f about four years later, I was in that same place, and that same teacher was there, and she said, Walter, I have something for you. What was it? In a replica of the gold pendant, which was a yoke. I can show it to you afterwards if you want to. And a little uh, round plate that turned in this yoke like that. And when you twirled it, it spelled out, I love you in black letters on the gold. It's very pretty. So I had this, we kissed goodbye and she left. And that was the end of our love affair. <laughs> 
I was 15, 16, yeah, 15 years old. And um, about 10 days later, uh, a person came to my father and told him that uh, a couple and, a, and seemingly the daughter of this couple had been found shot dead uh, about 10 kilometers east of our city. What this did to me, uh, I cannot describe to you. And the proof is that I still carry this thing, uh, you know, with me and had the copy made for my wife. Because Lydia was a lovely young woman. So these things stick with you. They are inscribed in your brain. And uh, really, that particular incident I don't want to forget because it's a lovely memory. Uh, on the 29th of June, the surrounding soldiers uh, around the, the, the periphery of the ghetto, uh, who had the loudspeakers and what have you, announced to us to be ready the following day, uh, one uh, suitcase per person, to uh, get resettled in the East. Now, I want to underline resettled in the East. Not sure what this says to you, but it's a euphemism for what what, what, what it meant being sent into a concentration camp, basically. The, the Germans, the Nazi Germans, had beautiful euphemisms for all kind of miserable words. Uh, and so uh, the following day, uh, all these Jewish people from various parts were streaming down under guard, and we were taken to a, a, a junkyard, which was the assembly place for us, and in the junkyard there were long tables, uh, sort of like these tables in a long, long row, and we filed by and to hand over all of our valuables. On the tables was a handgun and a whip, these leather whips that were about that, that big, and um, leather. Uh, so we did that, okay, we handed over things. Bracelets, uh, wedding rings, everything had to be handed over. Men were separated from women. And the men were then separated into three groups, old folks, middle-aged middle, middle -aged people, and young people. I was among the young people, men, and women the same way. And now I come to something that pertains to what we have heard about these days because I was taken from my parents. And uh, one of the, the most horrible memories that I have, I did some good memories as you heard with Lydia, terrible memories of this, my mother running behind me. These were SS soldiers, uh, and my mom shouting, Valti, that's an endearment for Walter. Valti, Valti, don't leave us. <laughs> don't leave us, or try not to leave us when you have an SS man right next to you, you know, shoving you in, in a certain direction. And so I'm, th this is why I'm so terribly upset about what's happening on our southern border, okay? Are you with me? I mean, to me, the relationship between parents and children, if there's anything holy in our lives, that is a holy relationship to me. Uh, so I felt horrible, I was scared to death, but I cannot imagine what my mother felt, I, that's beyond me. And you know, I, I do have some nightmares every so often. It's gotten more rare uh, as I get older. And I start, I don't talking in my sleep, my wife wakes me up, she gets all upset, you know. And usually it's separation from my parents that, I, that the nightmare is about. And uh, not as a child, but as an adult. And uh, suddenly I have no identity papers, and I'm lost in town. And uh, at the worst point of this dream, of this nightmare, she wakes me up or I wake up. So these are just things that are inscribed in your circuitry, in, in your mind, in your brain. We were marched off uh, to, uh, to the station. Uh, of the town and uh, just waited there 
And then trains came and we were loaded into trains and we went off. Tell me again, 12 to 4.15 is that, or, or 4, 4? Class ends at 4.30. Oh, 4.30, yeah. but I will so stop at 4.15. Yeah, okay, questions. yeah, I just want to be sure. There's so much to tell, you know, to, to squeeze all this time in, into an hour and a quarter is almost impossible. It, not almost, it is impossible. So anyway, so the trains come, we are loaded on, and there were a lot of young people, of course, on these trains, and there was weeping and crying, and you know, we had never been separated from our parents. You know, here's a basic difference between Europe and here. Uh, I think you become uh, sort of grown up, not necessarily mature, but grown up faster than we did. Uh, I never left my town. Uh, until that, that time. I, I went to the mountains in the surroundings of the town with the family. But uh, to be just alone somewhere, cut off from my parents, this never happened before. And so this, this was a terribly traumatic time. Train goes, and uh, probably I would say an hour and a half is my guess. You know, we had no watches anymore that was handed over, so uh, I, I can't give you any dates uh, or times with any kind of precision. These are really estimates. And um, we arrive at the first, um, which was a slave labor camp. This is uh, in German. Anybody study German here? No. Um, it's, it's in German, it's in Zwangsarbeitslager. Zwang means, Zwang means forced, and Arbeit means work, and Lager means camp. So a forced labor camp, basically. <coughs> We built the Autobahn in that camp, with big expressways through Germany that Hitler started. And um, I, was, uh, I had to work in a uh, sand quarry, and here's what happened there. We had to load sand you know, out, of, out of a mountain, basically, that was, was opened up, full of sand, and shovel that into small, uh, construction type transportation cars. It's about all I can say. They were triangular like that, and uh, they were filled up, and then they could be just tipped over, and the sand was falling out. And I, I just came, yes, from a ghetto, but um, my mother somehow, despite the fact that we were marked with a white band with a blue Star of David to identify us, my mother, prior to the moment that I'm telling you now, had friends among all oh, the farmers who would come to the market. Most farmers didn't want to sell to Jews anything. They didn't want to be seen talking with Jews, let alone selling them food. But my mom had connections. So we never really went uh, hungry before our deportation. So I was, pretty in, I was in pretty good shape when I arrived at the first camp. And I shoveled, because my dad had taught me, you know, good work ethics. When you are doing something, do it right, <laughs> regardless whether it's Nazi Germans or anybody else. You know, that was his approach. And there's nothing bad about it, maybe a little bit naive. And so I shoveled, and my lorry was filled up faster than anybody else's. And suddenly, one day, about two weeks into that experience, I found myself in the sand being beaten up by fellow prisoners. And I was stunned. I didn't know what to make of this. Of course, at the construction site, I couldn't do anything about it. But when we marched back to camp, I found one of these guys. And uh, I asked him, have you lost your mind? Why, do you, why did you beat me up? And he said, because you're stupid, he said. But after I tell you what to do, you'll no longer be stupid. You'll be smart as we are. When the guards look, you shovel. When the guards don't look, you stand. You don't do anything. That is how you're going to preserve your strength. That is a smart thing to do. Besides, you're not contributing to the war effort of Mr. Hitler. You know. So, OK. I started understanding at that point, and I slowed down. 
What I didn't tell you is that when we, you arrived, when we arrived at the first camp, our hair was, uh, was clipped to about one eighth of an inch. And then in the middle of my head, they shaved out about a one inch wide stripe going from here to, to the back. And uh, that happened in more than one camp, not in every camp, but we used to call this thing the Laos Alley because later on we were infected in, in, with lice. And so, you know, you have to, even in a situation like this, amazing as it sounds, you have to keep your humor because it's only through humor that you can resist your oppressor. You have nothing else in your hand to, to do it with. So you make fun of them or you make fun of yourself even in a way. A louse alley, okay? And just see the lice walking around here. It was miserable because these lice eventually bored into your body. And before we went to sleep, we had a louse inspection. And we looked at each other naked, of course, in the barracks to see where the lice are. And then very, very carefully pulled them out. Because if you left anything, like a little leg of the louse, in your body, you were infected. And when you were infected, you could no longer work. And I'll tell you about my infection a little later. And uh, when you could no longer work, you were sent to Auschwitz, which was not very far away, or to Gross Rosen, which was a bigger camp, not far from us. And Gross Rosen, they lined you up against the wall and machine gunned you and cremated you. In Auschwitz, you know what happened. They gassed you and cremated you, and you went out back into the air through the chimneys. Now, this is hard to understand, but it did happen. And you can go to Auschwitz today and visit. And you know there's a big problem that we have now with regard to Auschwitz. The, the, the buildings are falling apart because it's been 70, 80 years. And so if you fix the buildings, those people who say, uh, the, uh, the Holocaust deniers, as we call them, will say, aha, you see, these are fresh bricks that you've put in there. This never happened. These were not concentration camp buildings. And if you don't do it, then the buildings fall apart and there's nothing left. So you know it's, um, it's a no-win situation, basically. So I went through seven camps. They sent me through seven camps. And uh, le let me just say, food, totally inadequate. Uh, in the evening, uh, a piece of bread of about 10 ounces, uh, sometimes 11, sometimes 9, depending on how the fellow prisoner that saw you um, took, uh, uh, related to you. Was he a friend? cut the piece a little bigger, uh, was he, didn't, if he didn't care, uh, cut it a little smaller, but you get only eight pieces out of one loaf, so if he, you got one bigger, another one had to be smaller. Uh, I weighed 87 pounds at the end of my imprisonment in 1945. And I know this because on our way home after our liberation by the Soviet army, there were uh, Red Cross stations that um, uh, registered us, that took our numbers uh, down, and that weighed us. And so I still have that uh, document actually at home. I still have that. Uh, I mentioned numbering. Now, I have no tattoo. Tattoos were done only in Auschwitz. My father, who was in Auschwitz, had a tattoo on the inside of his left arm. So I want to ask you a question now. Why would the Germans take your name away and give you a number, identify you as a number tattooed, or in my case, uh, a yellow triangle on, on my, my jacket and in back of the jacket with a number on it? I'll tell you how I got this, um, how I came to it. Uh, why, why numbering? Why number a person? Hmm? You have to talk loud, I'm sorry. Dehumanizing. Dehumanizing. Is. Dehumanizing. 
Yes, ma'am. Dehumanize. Dehumanize. Okay, thank you. I, I have hearing aids, but not as good as your regular ears. <laughs> so, yeah, dehumanize. And by that you mean, I hope, uh, I, I don't want to have a big conversation here, to make out of you an object, okay? Because objects can be gotten rid of any old way. Uh, I mean, uh, if it were possible, I had an axe I could bust this thing up, right? I mean, it, it's even hard. It, it's hard even, I think, for a person uh, like a guard in a concentration camp to, to kill you, a, another human being. But if you are indoctrinated sufficiently to the point where that guard does not recognize you as a human being anymore, but as an object, then it's easy to do. Um, so let, let me jump to another camp now to, to show you an, a, an example of sort of dehumanization uh, we talked about in the car. Uh, I was in a camp by the name of Schmiedeberg where they produced engines for V1s and V2s that were these missiles that were not guided missiles, just, uh, just missiles that were shot into England. And we were building uh, test, uh, test buildings out of concrete, steel reinforced concrete, where these engines were tested or would be tested. Um, so I had a very privileged job there. Um, I was bending the irons, the iron rods that go into the concrete. So imagine uh, two of these tables, or maybe three of them, put together, the size of uh, three tables pressed together. And in the middle, an arm, a long arm, that sticks out beyond the table, depending on the position of the arm, OK? And you feed in a bar, a rebar. Do you know what a rebar is? OK, a prisoner puts in the rebar here between something that's stationary and a bolt that's on the arm. And then you step on a pedal, and the arm starts turning, and the steel, the, the rebar, is put into a shape. OK? Can, can you imagine that? Now, I, I was in Schmiedeberg, as I said. I was a fairly good camp in terms of food, you know, we weren't beaten or anything like that. In other camps, yes. And I'll come to the one where that happened again, where I was beaten. Uh, so a young man was working this machine. And uh, we, we saw this man. And as the arm moved in this particular case, it grabbed his thighs, squeezed his thighs between the table and the arm. And he passed out. He probably died. And I was given the job. Well, it was a dangerous job. I was scared of the machine, of course. I was very careful, needless to say. So we bent these long bars into various shapes, you know, that were put together with wires with other shapes uh, into a three-dimensional thing, and then lowered between the two walls into which the concrete was poured. You say, you're nodding your head. You're must know something about that. So uh, I am now the, 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 the man who, who does this. So uh, an engineer comes to me and says, follow me. So he takes me to his office on the construction site and uh, brings out a blueprint, rolls it out, and says, you see, this is now a new shape. And on a blueprint, you know, all these bends are the dimensions for all this, right? I was pretty good with arithmetic, so I added up these dimensions. And these dimensions added up did not correspond to the total dimension that was below, you know, end to end of that finished piece. And my language, uh, being German, native German, I said to the man, uh, there's something wrong with this with these dimensions. I can't do that. The engineer sits behind the desk. And I see he's startled. There's the silence. And then he says, you're not a Jew. 
Well, I didn't laugh, believe me, but I was just flabbergasted. What, what, what in the world does, does he mean? I said, yes, sir, I am a Jew, that's why I'm here. You know, I'm in the blue, white striped uh, thing, and you know, obviously a prisoner. And again, silence, he says, no, 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 you, you, you cannot be a Jew. And I finally you know, worked up my courage, and I said, well, why not? What makes you think that I'm not a Jew? He said, Jews are not capable of speaking German. Now, what I'm trying to tell you here is education, OK? This is what he had been taught wherever he went to school, OK? That Jews just are inferior beings. Normal humans, yes, can learn a language, but Jews are not normal human beings. Now, that's why you can kill them, too, because they are in number. OK, uh, th this is not the end of the story. This has a better ending than that. Uh, when I told him this, he still, I don't know whether he believed it or not, he went to a closet, pulled out his lunchbox, opened it, and gave me half of his sandwich that his wife had prepared for him. And then I was dismissed and went back to my machine. So, I mean, this is what education does. And since I'm at that point, I do want to show you something else. Have you heard of Hitler's book, Mein Kampf? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen it? No. So I want to show you that if we're not careful, a dictator person, as Hitler was, and as somebody else would like to be, I think, uh, Mein Kampf has a picture of Hitler in here, OK? And then you go one other page, I think. No, no, you go backwards, the beginning. You get this page. And what does this page say? Now, if there was someone here who studied German, could translate, but I, I know German. So I'll translate for you. To the newly married couple, Kaiser is the name, uh, in memory of the day of the marriage in front of the um, mayor's office, in the city of Hanover, uh, actually the capital city, Hanover, uh, given with best wishes. Nazi Germany arrived at the point where Hitler worship supplanted Christian worship. Okay, Hitler did not like church people, he didn't like Christians, whether Lutherans or Roman Catholics, didn't like them. But the, 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 the people, OK, uh, considered him to be the messiah, basically. He was a messianic character. And interestingly enough, something else, that during the first two years of his chancellorship, things improved in Germany. Uh, there were much fewer people that were unemployed. There was more food on the tables. This didn't, very, didn't last very long. Then it started going down very rapidly. And the end, of course, was that he committed suicide and that Germany was completely destroyed. This is why I'm coming back to the first words that I exchanged with you, or rather told you, be careful, think critically, OK, on what's happening. I brought another book. I, find that I found that in, 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 a, in the apartment that was given to us after we came back home and we were given a, a two-room apartment because our apartment had been totally vandalized. This is a textbook called Die Judenfrage, which means the Jewish question, and uh, uh, material to be used in schools, it says. It is written by a man by Ernst Dobers, who wrote into the book uh, in memory of our uh, of our teaching session together or something like that. It was a retreat, I think, and signed Dr. Dobers, see? But the amazing thing is that up here on the inside, a man by the name of Weber writes, Das Heil kommt von den Juden. Salvation comes from the Jews. Gospel of John 4.22. And that guy also was at that retreat. And that guy didn't buy what was being taught. Do you follow me? 
So I cherish this book, and I will not pass it around because it's crumbling, really. So Germany was a, a, a mixed bag. The people who hated him, Hitler that is, most of them followed him, probably 98%, I would say, something like that. Okay, so I, uh, I'll probably go five minutes too long. I can't do much about that. Uh, I will tell you about my liberation. I was in a camp by the name of Waldenburg, um, and there we drilled holes into bedrock. In Waldenburg, um, uh, at one point, well, it was May 8th, 1945, <clears throat> that we stood there uh, being counted before being marched out to where we drilled those holes into the bedrock. Uh, when I looked into the towers that had machine guns up there and big reflectors that lit up the camp at night, they noticed there was no soldier up there. They were abandoned. There was nobody there. But, you see, I weighed at that point 87 pounds, and my mind did not work anymore. Uh, you know, you have to be able to process information that comes to you, and that happens up here. And when your body becomes a skeleton, uh, your, your mind doesn't work, because the brain is an integral part of the rest of your body, okay? So I, I couldn't figure out what that meant. So we, all of us, I mean, we're in the, same, in, the, in the same situation. And then the triple gate with three fences around our camp opened, and the SS commander comes in, and um, all alone, by the way, and talks to the prisoner commander, because there was, the prisoners also had a commander, okay, who happened to be, in this particular case, a criminal. And they exchanged some words, not privy to what they said, the SS commander walks out, takes off a key ring from, from his belt, and throws the keys into the camp. And we didn't understand what that meant. And we just stand there at attention. And then we hear a noise, an engine noise. And here comes a Soviet Russian tank. Uh, in, the, in the tower was one, one soldier, a single tank, and the tank drives into the fences and smashes one whole side of the fence of the camp and keeps on going, a single tank. And we still don't know what's going on because our brains just don't function. So we must have stood another half hour maybe or so, 45 minutes. And then the man who stood next to me said, I think it's over. Let's go and organize some food. We were starved. The only thing that we could think of and talk about with each other was food, food, food. So organize was a jargon word. You know, when groups are together, they de develop a jargon. And so uh, get it one way or another. That's what organizing me. So we went down to Main Street of Waldenburg, abandoned town, completely abandoned. And uh, we um, see a truck sitting there. And we climb on the truck, a German military truck, shelves in the truck, cans there, brown cans. And this other guy somehow produced a screwdriver or something. We punch holes, we pry open the cans, and it's white grease, but it smells deliciously. It was pork grease. So we just go in with our hands and eat it. And below, chunks of pork. We eat that and can after can is being opened, and we swallow the stuff. Then we find the white sacks in the, in, the, uh, in, in the truck, and we slit that open, and the sugar, of course, it was sugar, okay, that just comes out. We get on all our fours, and we start shoveling sugar into our mouths, and then everything went black. I know nothing else, but then, Obviously, I'm here, I woke up. And I found myself between two white sheets and a bed. And opposite me on the wall was a cuckoo clock. I remember that. And the other guy was still sleeping. He was in a bed, too. And I, I, I don't know where I am. I don't know what has happened. And then the door opens, and a tiny little woman, four feet, four and a half feet, comes in. 
uh, sees me lying there with open eyes, sits down next to my, on my bed and says, jetzt ist alles vorüber, wir haben den Krieg verloren, sie sind frei. Uh, it's all over, we've lost the war, we are free. And I didn't understand. And I just fall back into my bed, I kept on sleeping again. Just exhausted in every way. A person can be exhausted. And then we both did wake up eventually. And uh, what we did is we walked to town. There was nobody there. Went into basements and opened suitcases of Germans that had left and uh, found clothing. We want to get rid of our filthy, filthy, uh, rotten uh, clothing. And so we found that. But then, you see, we had to make a decision. And it's very hard to make a decision after three years at that age, having made no decisions at all. All decisions were made for us. And so uh, we went back to camp. That's the best we could do. And there were fires, little here and there, and the people were roasting uh, maybe a rabbit or something. I, I don't know. And then women started coming to camp. In, in the blue-white dresses, you know. Three women, I remember, stood by the fence that had been demolished. And I walked up to them and said, excuse me, I was very, very shy and scared. Uh, during your time in the camps, did you po possibly run into one or two women by the name of Ziffer? And uh, one woman said, yeah, we were in the same room in, in the barrack. Uh, two women. And then a third woman, whose name I don't remember. And um, so I asked them, where? And they said, in Langen Bilau, a women's concentration camp about 30 kilometers uh, from, from our camp. Can't tell you what direction anymore. So I made my first independent decision. I left the camp. I went down to Waldenburg to the main street where we had marched through to work for probably six months is my guess. And I saw a bicyclist coming toward me, a German on a bicycle. And I walked toward him and I did this, and I said, get off the bike. And he did not argue. He gave me his bike because we looked like hell. And when I mean hell, I mean the real hell, you know, terrible. I got on the bike and it took me two days to pedal to get to Langenbilau. And I arrived at the women's camp, and uh, they, they were in pretty good shape, the women. They, had, they offered me good food, you know. They, they were much more practical than the men. That's what I'm trying to say. And so, of course, my question is, where do the Ziffers live? And they said, oh, over there in that barrack over there. So I walk over there. The Ziffers aren't there. Uh, they are out to organize food, see? And so they fed me. They said, me, sit down. They'll be in here in a few minutes. I sat down about half the distance to the door. And I waited. And then the door opens. And my mother comes in. My sister comes in. And my cousin comes in. My cousin had lost both her parents in Auschwitz, by the way. And they come in. And they walk right by me. And they look at me and smile at me. You know, as, as people smile at you in a grocery store when they give you the, the, uh, the cart, you know, it's always a smile. In America, people smile, much more so than in Europe, I think. And so I, um, uh, I'm flabbergasted. They just walked right by me, looked at me, smiled at me, walked to the corner, emptied their pockets with the food that they had organized, and I walk up to them and I had to introduce myself to my mom. And then, of course, things fell together into an understandable whole. So uh, that's basically the story. Uh, we were in camp together for a few days. Some men uh, came, came by uh, who, who had lived in the same area. Then we marched back. It was a long trek um, because the bridges had been blown up by the Germans you know, as they were fleeing. The, 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 the Russians who had come in were rather not very friendly people. Uh, we, we walked home, primarily walking. You know, sometimes a peasant helped us with, with a carriage, a horse-drawn carriage. 
few miles. And uh, we came home, and to our joy, my father already was there because Auschwitz was east of our camp at the, 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 um, the, 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 the Soviet Russians had liberated that camp before they had come to our camp. So my father was there. He was in the apartment of a maid we had before the war. And it was just, I, I don't think I need to go into the details. It was a big celebration, of course. And why am I here? Because about a year and a half later, the communist threats came in, and they wanted to me to, well, I mean, I, I got a summons to, uh, to be drafted into the communist army, and I said, uh-uh, you know, I had just lost years uh, without education. I implored my father to help me. He helped. It's a story in itself I can go into. But I got a passport and a visa for France. I went to Paris. I lived in Paris for almost two years, uh, and uh, then came to America. Voila, as the French say. Let me just end this by saying that living three years in a concentration camp changes your life forever. You are surrounded by brutality. You are surrounded by corpses. I didn't, I didn't get into didn't have enough time to tell you about my second camp, where the camp commander, German camp, camp commander, just uh, routinely killed people by giving them cold and uh, uh, boiling water. Uh, um, showers. showers, thank you. And uh, in between, beat them. And, and it's just a horrible st story, really. It was the camp of Brande. You can put that into your computer. You'll hear about the camp commander there whose name was Pompe, P-O-M-P-E. Put down, put down P-O-M-P-E. I, I helped uh, writing the stuff that's there. And um, it's, you, you see the world differently after an experience like this. And this is why I'm so terribly upset by what is happening now in our country. Um, so I hope... You will heed my words and uh, be politically involved and, and be, um, try to really find the differences between truth and falsehood because we're being fed a lot of falsehood these days. That's my hope. How about if we take a few questions? Would you do that? Yeah, right now. Some questions here? Okay, start right here. I just want to start by. Talk, talk a little louder. I just want to start by thanking you for coming in to share us. I think I speak for everyone. It's my heritage. Believe me. We're never going to forget yes. this. You are the hope. You will be the hope. We have to learn from someone. I really appreciate you coming here today. Um, my question is, when did you first begin to feel safe again? Faith? Safe. When did I feel safe again? Yes. Well, uh, when I received, uh, when, uh, when we arrived at home, finally, in, in our town, everything we owned, uh, I mean, like the apartment, the furniture. My father had a library of roughly 2,000 books. It was gone. And the furniture was destroyed. Because after the Germans had left, the Russians came in and established themselves in the very same apartment. And uh, then, it's a long story, we had nothing, okay? So we were then assigned uh, to a one-bedroom place for five people. That's why I discovered the books on the shelf. You know, that I showed you. I felt safe from then on, except for one thing. Uh, having been summoned to, uh, to enter the army, you know, the communist army, um, and my father had bought the documents for me, both the passport and the visa. Where they got the money from my family, that is, I don't know. But I had to go from the Czech Republic, okay, uh, to, to, to Paris, and I was scared to death. Uh, that's a story in itself that's absolutely remarkable. Uh, it's in the book, if somebody, if you want to buy the book. Uh, I, I, I was scared to be stopped at the border, and they would find out that these were fake documents, basically, and I'd be in deep trouble. Uh, this didn't happen <laughs> because on the train, uh, well, let me just say to you in two sentences. 
Uh, as I was on the train, a soldier uh, opened the, the sliding door, that's third class, second class, first class, European trains, and said, Who's, who plays chess here? Chess, okay? And everybody just sat there scared. And my father had taught me chess when I was four years old. I said, follow me. He took my suitcase, took me to first class. I was a general, a Czech general, was sitting at the window with a little table that you would sort of open up with a chessboard there. And the guy says to me, sit down, play chess. And about half an hour later, we were in the middle of a game. The train came to a stop at the border, and the door was shut open. There were three soldiers there, because that was occupied Germany. There was a German soldier there, there was a Russian soldier there, and I don't know who the third guy was. I don't remember. So he comes in, and uh, he starts saying uh, travel documents, and the general who sat at the, at the window just said, just did this. And the guy clicked, saluted, closed the door, and the half an hour later or so, when I heard other people being taken off the train, the train kept on going, and I went to Paris. And I mean, you know, luck has a lot to do with one's life. Let's face it. You're, you're, I didn't pre-program that. But uh, I'm eternally thankful to the German general who wanted to play chess. <laughs> I lost the game, by the way. <laughs> Any other questions? Feel free, anything. With uh, the story that you were telling about the, um, the soldier that shared the sandwich, yeah. Did you, no, not a soldier. Or that, that, that was an engineer. Oh, an engineer. Yeah. Did you, so, did you ever come across any other soldiers, or, or any soldiers in general, that you, you truly felt a sense of humanity from them, that maybe they did know the difference between right and wrong, but maybe had no choice, or it was, or did you genuinely feel like, no, each one of them is? Unfortunately not. You know, we, we didn't have conversations with our guards. That, that, that was a no-no, it was an impossibility. Um, I'm, I'm sure there were some there, because there were some people who treated us differently from other people. I mean, there were some who just beat us up constantly. You said the, the wrong thing, or you held your shovel the wrong way, and you were beaten up. Uh, and you see, the trouble with most of the people with whom I was imp imprisoned were people from Poland. Jewish people from Poland. You know, Poland before the war had three and a half million peop Jewish people. I mean, a vast population. And uh, these people, uh, the, the Jewish people, okay, really had their own, um, their own world there. Uh, many towns, little towns, you know, were half Jewish. And so the, the language was Yiddish, as I mentioned to you. It's a special language which is a mix of medieval German and Hebrew and some Polish. And um, um, they didn't understand the Germans. So for instance, give you an example. We built a highway there in Sakrau. Uh, a man comes up to me and gives me a rake and says, rake that slope. I knew what to do. I understood him. He showed me and we, we spoke, we did. No problem. I, I did a good job. He speaks to a Polish Jewish man, an older man, who has no idea of German. He doesn't understand. He's never held a tool in his hand. Because they, the Jewish men in Poland, were in a yeshiva, which is a place where you study the Bible and Talmud, and these are Jewish expressions I'm giving you. Uh, so he looks at the German, you know, eh? And he gets beaten up. And I mean, these people got hurt to the point where they could no longer perform and lost their lives. It didn't take much, believe me. I was shot into my foot, uh, my right foot at one point, in Waldenburg, in that last camp. Uh, it must have been a ricocheted bullet. I don't think I was actually shot. Because what happened as we marched, <clears throat> a very early in the morning was dark, 
uh, a person ran from, from behind the church and threw a package into our ranks. I was the one who picked up the package. And there were hands all around me trying to take this away from me. But I managed to get a piece of this bread into my mouth, which was the best thing. I was in seventh heaven, just to have two slices of dark bread with margarine in between. And shots rang out. And I think the people were shooting at the person who threw the package in. But I, I was hit by bullet, by bullet. And not terribly seriously, just grazed the outer part of my foot. Uh, and I, I must say that I am grateful to two doctors, two Jewish doctors in the camp, who had a kind of, call it a hospital. I mean, they had aspirin, they had a scalpel, and um, I know they had pro probably, well, not probably, they had alcohol because they poured alcohol on my foot. And then they hid me in the little hospital under, under the bed. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that the good things that happened, uh, not particularly by the Germans, but by fellow inmates, the bad things that happened by fellow inmates who, um, well, who cheated, who stole, not the best of, you know, just, when you, just because you have a group that has the same fate, we were all prisoners. We were all destined to die. That doesn't necessarily mean that all the people were solidly connected, were the, the good people, the bad people, okay? And we could talk about that for a long time, but don't have the time for that. So um, I'm, I'm convinced. Well, I, I know from, I mean, if you read the history, that, that, that there were decent people in Germany. Uh, have you ever heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? You haven't. Uh, he was a, ch a church person. Uh, he was a member of what's called the Bekennende Kirche, the Confessing Church, absolutely against Hitler, who participated in a, uh, in a plan to blow him up. And uh, the bomb blew up, blew up actually, but Hitler just got a few scratches. Somebody else got killed. Just to tell you that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a tremendous person, I mean a hero. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hanged in Flossenburg two days before the end of the war. So, you know, anybody who didn't agree with Hitler uh, ended up dead. And we were all destined to be dead. You know, in, in America, they make, we make a difference between concentration camps and death camps, extermination camps. Well, I mean, yes, there's a difference. You got to Auschwitz with an extermination camp, and within 24 hours, you were dead. Uh, you got to a camp where I was, and I lived for three years. But the end would have been around the corner. Uh, we were all destined to die to be murdered one way or another, through exhaustion, through killing, through shooting, you name it. So uh, there were organizations that, um, that resisted Hitler in Germany. A, a lot of them were young people. Um, uh, one was called the White Rose, the, the Weisse Rose, that uh, did underground work, you know, and. Um, so yeah, there was resistance, but well, any other questions? Everything clear? Crystal clear. So let me use this opportunity to thank you on behalf yeah. of the class, if we might. Thank you. It's a privilege to talk to you, and I hope you will remember this and take it to heart. and. Uh, do, do uh, everything for democracy to survive. That, that's our purpose, I think. <laughs>